Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Trzewicki and I'm a PhD student here at AGH. Um, and today I'm going to show you how um, evolutionary algorithms uh, can be made continuous with the use of uh, asynchronous agents. I will also see how uh, functional patterns allow to achieve this. Uh, but first, let me st start with uh, a short introduction. So, uh, do anybody here know this man? I don't see any hands. So, uh, well, this is Hermes. Hermes is a local hippie here in Krakow who uh, travels around the region uh, with his horses. And uh, he often comes to Krakow in spring or in the fall. Uh, and you can sometimes run across him when he get, grazes his horses uh, on the castle hill uh, next, but, well, by the this, this uh, uh, river. And the thing is, two years ago, his horse, uh, when he was crossing the main square, which you may have already visited, his horse started to give birth. And finally gave birth uh, on the planta, uh, the green area uh, around the city center. And well, they stayed there only for a day or two, and then, then they, they, they moved on. Uh, but uh, the reason why I am telling you this is because uh, I was amazed how the baby horse um, was able to you know, stand by itself uh, just a few hours after uh, its birth, and then was able to move on just a few days uh, later. And um, in fact, many animals are able to quickly master all the basic skills needed to survive, and they do not need, nor, they, nor do they get any attention from their parents. And um, our species is an interesting exception. Uh, in a, this book I read many years ago, um, Morris claimed that we have to give birth uh, in our species so early because we basically have you know, very big heads. Uh, and the heads of our babies are so big that if we were to give birth later, the head wouldn't come out of the uterus. Uh, in fact, when you look at the proportion of the human head on you know, the body head ratio, uh, you can see this clearly. So as a result, our babies are born early and are very dependent on the parents. And they stay such for many years. Morris claimed uh, through there that this long dependency to our parents uh, is perhaps the reason why we develop such high social skills and as a consequence, maybe why we've developed culture uh, at all. And uh, in another uh, book you may have heard, Dawkins uh, in turn claimed that genes are not the only vector of evolution. Instead, we may also inherit cultural genes called memes uh, from our social environment. And together, all of these form our extended phenotype, which, well, in turn, is the actual uh, property which you know, uh, is used in evolution. And uh, speaking of memes, uh, you might be probably wondering why I am telling you all of this. Uh, my point is there is no such thing as discrete generations in nature. I mean, uh, of course, if you have two related individuals, you can always compute a discrete genealogical distance between them. But um, if you look at it on a time axis, uh, generations overlap. So basically, you have the possibility to share much more information between individuals and subsequent generations than just uh, genetic information. And okay, so now we can, uh, we can move on to evolutionary algorithms. Uh, that being said, well, I suppose most of you probably know the basic uh, form of an evolutionary algorithm. We start with an initial population, uh, and, which we, well, and we generate the next population by selecting the best individuals, uh, which are some potential solutions to our problem. So we select the best individuals, and then we transform them using some uh, <coughs> operators like mutation, crossover, right? And we repeat it until some stopping condition is met. Uh, sometimes you can introduce also elitism, which consists in passing the best individuals from one generation to another without changing them. But all in one, you, all, you always end up with discrete generations, right? You always, uh, for every study, it's basically a single loop for the full, whole population. So uh, why is that the problem? Uh, well, well, no, why is it so, first? Uh, well, because we have synchronized and global selection. We select 
uh, from the whole population in one step. And why is it bad? Well, because we lose this property, which is in nature, that generations overlap and additional information can be passed over. So, in, in order to overcome this problem, uh, a new algorithm was developed here at AGH, uh, well, quite some years ago, uh, which combines evolutionary algorithms with multi-agent systems. And in these systems, the probability of reproduction of an individual is not only reflected by its genes and the corresponding thickness, but also by his, uh, well, the history, the knowledge of, of the individual, which together form the extended phenotype. And um, agents who are proven to be good uh, enough, for a long time enough, uh, well, can spontaneously reproduce and produce new agents. So in this way, selection starts to be decentralized and is well said to emerge from uh, the interactions of independent agents. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at, a, at, a, at an example. So this is a very, very simple, uh, all that. This is a very simple example of uh, an evolutionary multi-agent system. So every agent is assigned with uh, a solution, the corresponding thickness, and some initial energy. And agents meet randomly with each other, uh, and they fight by comparing fitness. The winner takes some energy from the loser, and when they gather enough energy, they can reproduce and produce new agents. And obviously when the energy drops to zero, they die. Okay, so uh, well, the algorithm is not uh, very complicated, but the question is how to program it, right? There is a number of uh, agent software on the market, uh, but most of them uh, will share will fall into one of the two categories. The first is to treat agents as simple data structures, which are only processed sequentially in a loop. Uh, but, well, then we, it's very simple to do this, but we lose any parallelism, and we also end up again with more or less um, sequential discrete generations. So the other way is to treat agents as objects and put them into separate threads every agent in a separate threat. But uh, I think, uh, well, I, I really don't need to tell you what happens if we want to have, let's say, 10,000 agents, right, with 10,000 threads. So no, that's, that's not a solution. Uh, so uh, what could we do to, to allow to, to, well, to have both uh, many, many agents, but not having many threads, and still get well, uh, potential for parallelism? Well, we could use actors, obviously. And um, the only problem we'll have to overcome is that actors are by nature reactive, right? They react to messages. Uh, agents should be proactive. But, well, uh, generally, we just need to put a loop somewhere. I'll get back to it uh, in a few slides. Uh, another key question in, uh, in such agent simulations is how to efficiently design the meetings of agents. Um, that is how to put ag agents together so that they can perform some actions together. Uh, in a synchronous implementation, that's not very difficult, right? Because we have a global access to the whole population. Uh, but well, it becomes more difficult when we want to have asynchronous agents. Uh, and we could uh, design a broadcasting protocol uh, through which agents could, could negotiate meetings, but well, it's not very efficient because there is a lot of communication which is needed and involved. So, uh, instead, we should use a mediator, a mediator pattern, and introduce an additional entity which would mediate the meetings between the agents. And um, in a recent work, we, uh, we proposed a way to introduce such uh, mediating entities, so, which allow to efficiently implement agent meetings, both in synchronous and asynchronous implementations. And in fact, it's very similar to the MapReduce model, which you all know. So I'm going to show you now how to design such a multi-agent system uh, in a functional way, using two, uh, two types of functions. The first function is agent behavior. Uh, when triggered by uh, an external action or even event, uh, Agents choose an action to be performed by, based on the current state, knowledge, behavior, etc. We've already 
talk about this. And so in other words, for those of you who are uh, well, in the multi-agent topic, this is a very simple belief desire intent model. Um, so here, here is what it looks like in our algorithm in Scala. <coughs> so uh, based on the energy, uh, the agent chooses some strategy to execute. So if the energy is zero, it dies. If it's above some threshold, it, re it reproduces, and otherwise it fights. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, map reduce step is as follows. So we have some agents, and we define some behaviors, and then simply we map agents to behavior, and we group them uh, into these behaviors. So uh, the second function in this model is a meeting function. For every behavior we saw before, uh, the collection of corresponding agents is transformed into a new one. So again, with an example, uh, we need to, to process every kind of, of behavior and all the agents which chose this behavior. So as we can see, uh, well, these agents can be shuffled, grouped into smaller groups, and each such group uh, is processed as a separate meeting by applying a different specialized function, right? We have a fight function which will exchange energy by comparing fitness. We'll have a reproduction function which will, which, which will simply uh, apply some genetic operators and so on. And so uh, the second map reduce step, uh, the outputs to the meetings are, uh, well, the edges are divided into groups and uh, the inputs of every meeting well, are processed and they yield some other agents as a result. So here, for example, we can have two agents which have the same energy uh, on the input, and on the output we, have, we can have a pair of agents and one agent has taken some energy from the other. Another example is on re with reproduction, right? We, we had two agents meeting for reproduction and as a result we have four agents, two parents and two children. And of course, when we have, well, like a deaf uh, behavior, well, the output is empty, right? So all we have to do now is reduce the results of, of all of these meetings into the new population. Uh, okay, so you, you might, you might uh, tell that this model is still, uh, is still step-based, right? We still have an iteration and it's still this, we can still end up with discrete generation. Uh, the fact is it does not have to. This can be programmed both in a, in a synchronous way and in an asynchronous way. So, uh, well, the synchronous version could be simpler in Scala. Uh, we simply group agents by behavior and then flat map each group uh, with a meeting function. And that's all, right? We have a new population and we only have to iterate it until some stopping condition is met. Uh, the, it's uh, a bit more complicated if we want to, to do this asynchronously, um, but still it's not very hard. Um, first, we need to uh, represent every agent as an actor. And then we have to introduce some mediating entities which will allow uh, such agents in actors to communicate without exchanging too much, uh, too much messages. So we introduce something which is called a meeting arena. And every agent uh, initially calls the, meeting, uh, <coughs> the behavior function to determine the kind of area it wants to join. Basically, every behavior is represented by a separate area. <coughs> and then the area can wait for a timeout to pass, or it, it, it can wait for uh, another agent to join. And when one of these conditions is met, it can simply trigger a meeting, an asynchronous meeting, which means that the arena can go back to listen for incoming agents. Now all we have to do is asynchronously call the meeting function for these two agents, or one, or, or more, it depends on the algorithm we want to have. And uh, the last animation I don't have in uh, OpenOffice uh, was the update of the state of the initial agents, right? As a result of the meeting, the state of these agents can be updated, new agents may be created, and these agents can be terminated. Okay, so, uh, the fact is that we don't, you, you don't really see the loop here because of, of, of the messy uh, um, animation, but uh, if you imagine arrows on the left and on the right, you, you basically have the loops 
these are the proactive loops that we needed. But the interesting point is that every agent has an independent loop. We no longer have a global loop in the whole population. And as a result, we no longer have our artificial generations. Actually, every agent has an equal chance uh, to meet and to reproduce, and the only limitation is the resources on, on the computer we have, right? Because, of course, in practice, um, we'll have much less, uh, much less cores in agents, because we want to have thousands, tens of thousands of agents. Uh, but, well, this can be overcome, because we can use a dedicated dispatcher uh, for uh, the agent's pool. And, uh, of course, the order in which uh, the agents get to call the behavior function and the order in, uh, in which they get to meet uh, determines the rest of the algorithm. But this order is actually something which depends on the dispatcher we use, and we can use different policies. We can also look at this like as, uh, well, the, sequ the sequential synchronous version we saw before, right, with a simple loop, is just a special case. Because it's just a special case of a dispatcher, we take the incoming agents, and, uh, well, we allow, well, it's, it's, it's a mix of a f uh, first in, first out, right, and a third dispatcher, but, well, this can genera generally be expressed as a special case of this. But also other policies can be used. We can uh, allow agents to, uh, to, uh, to execute randomly in random order. And well, eventually when we have enough cores in our computers, all of them could basically execute completely independently. So uh, we have implemented this algorithm in both Scala and in Erlang. And <laughs> it's very sad for me to say, but uh, the Scala uh, asynchronous implementation turned out to be uh, worse than uh, the Erlang one. So that's why I didn't brought a, a graph because I don't want uh, <laughs> to share this uh, um, because I'm very sad about it and I'm still working on it. Uh, but we also ran uh, the Erlang version on uh, nodes with 12 cores in the frontend, and we compared an asynchronous implementation, a fully asynchronous implementation, with um, a hybrid implementation in, we, in which we basically had the sequential uh, algorithm but, but running in separate processes. So that every process is like an island and every island has a sequential algorithm inside and the islands communicate through migrations. And we found out that uh, while well, both algorithms are similar in the beginning but uh, in later stages of the computation, uh, the asynchronous version is clearly the blue one uh, is clearly better. So, uh, how? Hmm? Why, why can you read it better from that graph? Sorry? Why, uh, how can you read it better from that graph? Because, well, uh, on the y axis you have uh, the fitness value which needs to be uh, minimized. So the blue graph is both lower and it also has a much, uh, a much um, smaller uh, standard deviation, which is the bar of C. So it finishes faster. It finishes, no, uh, it, it takes fewer populations. It takes fewer populations to reach uh, a better result and with greater certainty. Yeah. So, to sum up, um, well, we can express uh, a multi-agent system like, like this by defining a behavior function uh, and a meeting function for every behavior. So we basically split the logic of the system into these two functions. We encapsulate agent logic into the first, and we encapsulate the protocol into a meeting function. Function. We don't have to well to implement any broadcasting protocol and negotiation and so on. We assume that these agents will get together, and we all need to uh, well to program the, inter the interaction once they do. Second, uh, we can apply this model uh, together with with actors to get. Uh, if, we look, if we looked at the previous, if we previous uh, uh, image, we basically uh, well, could have like a stream of agents coming from the agent's pool and going through the arenas, performing meetings and returning to the, uh, to the agent's pool. And this stream can be made parallel because the meetings of the agents are independent. So basically the more cores we have, the more parallel it gets. And also, if we don't have enough cores, we can also try to tweak uh, the policy of the dispatcher 
and we can well, we can have interesting examples. And a sequential version is a special case for such a model. And finally, uh, well, the lack of explicit generations we have achieved will prove to be uh, more efficient, as as, as Torben asked. Mm. Okay, so that's it for today. Do you have any questions? Are those implementations uh, available somewhere on GitHub? Uh, they can be. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are on bucket, And I think the repository is private as of, as of now, but we can make it public anytime. Once it's, because it's, you know, it's not really stabilized, it's not really a library, because it's more like research, but we can always fork it on GitHub so we can look at it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.